So, looking at the Good News Mission. Good News Mission is led by this man, Aksu Park, who founded the Good News Mission. A little bit of the history here where, where this started. In 1962, this man, Dick York, an American missionary, went to South Korea to teach people about Jesus. Aksu Park was one of them, uh, along with several other guys, Dick York and several others. Case Glass, I think, was the guy's name, and some others. They met with the South Koreans. They got to know the language. They told them about Jesus. And three of these individuals in particular, they ended up getting this nickname of Gwonpa, which in Korean it means the salvation sect, because they were going out in the communities, they were very zealous for what Dick York had taught them, and telling people about Jesus, and it was like a badge of honor for them to be called the salvation sect, because they knew they were distinct and different from the churches in the area and the communities that were going to church that were kind of like dead churches. So they really stood out as people that were zealous for the gospel, and Aksu Park was one of these of uh, the Salvation Sect. In 1972, according to Aksu Park, Dick York ordained him, and Dick York says, "No, I did not ordain Aksu Park. I met Dick York after I started researching the Good News Mission it was about five years, five six years ago. I." Looking at Oxu Park and what he said about his past and everything, the, this this name of Dick York kept coming up. So I did some digging and found Dick York. He's still alive. He lives in the United States, and he was going to be doing a presentation in my area. And so I met with him and interviewed him, and he's, he said, no, I did not ordain him. Dick York was very much against titles and ordination. It wasn't about making a name for yourself. It was about Jesus. I find him to be a very humble, very honest, wonderful man. And his name is being trashed all over the place because people think, well, he started Good News Mission. No, he didn't. He taught Oxford Park about Jesus, and everything changed after this. So the Good News Mission started in 1986 by Oxford Park. In 2001, he started venturing in different areas. You might not have encountered Good News Mission, maybe you have, but maybe you've encountered this, the International Youth Fellowship, or IYF. And some of these organizations that he started, they sound good, like an organization, a Christian organization focused on youth. We want our youth to be passionate about God and learn about God, so you hear about International Youth Fellowship coming, you would want your youth and your church to be part of this. But what, what, what is this organization? What are their beliefs? And they also started in 2008. Oxford Park started a Mahanim Theology School. This you might not have come across, but in 2009, Good News Broadcasting started in Kenya and can be heard now over the Internet all over and with YouTube. Good News Broadcasting. In 2013, they started the International Mind Education Institute. Now, at the end of this talk, I'm going to be going over this quite a bit because this is a huge outreach arm. Some of these Korean groups, like another one we haven't even mentioned before, the Unification Church, they have all these different front organizations, and you end up getting involved without even realizing that it's part of a church or a religious organization. And Oxu Park has definitely followed along with this, with his International Mind Education Institute. So I'm going to be coming back to this at the end of this, so just file that in the back of your mind. Whatever this is, you'll find out. It's... It's interesting what Aksu Park has been able to do with his teaching. But I'm here to tell you that Good News Mission is cultic, definitely, in its theology, in its behavior. For one thing, Dick York, the guy that supposedly was behind this, a lot of people accuse him of being behind it, he said very clearly, no, this, this is definitely cultic. This picture of him is actually part of a videotape that I, I took of him where I asked him questions about Aksu Park, and... He said, he, this, this man, he just went off on his own. He started trying to make his own empire. And Dick York tried to pull him back, tried to rein him in. And Oxford Park would have nothing to do with it. Like, no, he's going to move forward. But this creates a problem for Oxford Park 
because he has talked about Dick York and how Dick York ordained me and Dick York was this major figure in his life. But Dick York says, no, no, this is a cult. Good News Mission is also condemned repeatedly by at least seven different Protestant denominations across South Korea. But if you listen to the Good News Mission advertisements, you would think that everybody in South Korea loves Good News Mission. Because Aksu Park supposedly turned the entire economy of the country around by his teachings. But no, they're not all in love with his teachings and what he's doing. But let's just look at some of the things that he teaches. Now, yesterday, when we talked about the Mormons, you saw some really, really wild things. Aksu Park's you, we need a lot of discernment sometimes when we look at some cults. Now, when we talk about the Mormons and they say that God was a man that lived on another planet, okay, we know something's going on. With Oxo Parts, it takes a lot of thinking often to figure out where is he coming from? What is his beliefs? His teaching is unquestioned by his followers. That's another huge warning flag. Whenever you have a leader that Everybody has to agree with and believe. And if if you're a pastor, I really challenge you to think this way. It's okay if the members of your congregation don't always agree with you. Now, on key things, yes, we we, we want people to be unified on Jesus, forgiveness of sin, salvation, the nature of God. But there's so many things in the Bible. I think it's okay if Christians don't see it the same way. Kennedy and I, we, we don't agree on everything. But we're brothers. We love each other. We're serving God together in the same ministry. He's laughing at me over there. See? He even thinks it's it's a joke to even bring this up. It's okay to have disagreements. But in a church like Oxu Parks, no. Everybody has to be on board. He is God's servant. Or the servant of God. Or the pastor is what he's called. Now, these are a lot better titles than what Lehman He that we looked at just a minute ago. So... I guess it's okay to be called the servant, right? That has the idea that you're helping people. But in their literature, it has some amazing, overblown characteristics described about him. It says since 1962, when he met Dick York, since 1962, he obtained complete devotion to God. And his life became completely based on the will of God and focused on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Anybody else? Does this fit you? (laughs) That is pretty extreme. And to have something like that published about you by your church should make you a little uncomfortable. But it gets worse. It lists awards that Oxu Park supposedly has. Grand prize for the new Korean. What even is this? New leader in Christianity. The true minister award. The 21st Century True Shepherd. I haven't been able to find that any of these words even exist anywhere on this planet. The 21st Century True Shepherd. What, what are some of these words? What do they even mean? New leader in Christianity. It's really important to look at the leader of the group or the founder and see how is this person described? How do the people in the group, what do they think of this guy? Oxu Park twists and adds scripture in his books. He will be talking about a passage of scripture and he will slip things in and say, this is in the Bible. For instance, in John 8, when Jesus is uh, talking to the woman, he says, I do not condemn you. You have no sin. This is the prostitute. The men were going to stone her. And he says, hey, who of you is without sin? Let him cast the first stone. Remember the story in John 8? Well, Oxford Park's right. He does say that he doesn't condemn her. He says that to her, but he doesn't say that you have no sin. And this is important, we'll see, in Oxford Park's theology, the idea that you don't have any sin. And that's why he would want to add this at this point. Another place is Luke 15 with the prodigal son. Oxford Park says that uh, the prodigal son left, uh, left his father for the purpose of running his own business and to prove himself successful. The Bible doesn't say that. Now, I could think maybe that was partly in the mind of the prodigal son, but the Bible doesn't say that. So that's 
starts to raise big suspicion when somebody starts to use the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says. It doesn't say anything about that, but it helps support his twisted theology that starts to come later on. So let's look what he teaches on the doctrine of atonement. Very, very important doctrine. He says that the Old Testament priest represents Israel, which some of this he has on track, and that's one thing with cults. They'll take some truth and add some error. That's what Satan did in the uh, the garden with with Eve. He takes some truth and mix it with theirs. So the Old Testament priest represents Israel. He places his hands on the sacrificial lamb, both of his hands on the lamb, and then the sin, according to Oxu Park, when he places his hands on the lamb, the sins will transfer to the lamb. And then Oxu Park ties this to John the Baptist. He says, John the Baptist is like the priest in the Old Testament. The same kind of thing. He, he lays his hands on Jesus. Or John the Baptist, he baptizes Jesus. He lays his hands on Jesus. And the sin transferred to Jesus at his baptism. And Jesus carried the sins of the world until he goes to the cross. So Jesus carries the sins until he dies for our sins on the cross. Sometimes with cults, when we look at these teachings, sometimes we shift and think, okay, there's, we know there's something strange about the way this is described, and we'll get to the problems here. So keep this file in mind, and then after we go through some of these doctrines, I'm going to circle back and we're going to look at these. So Jesus carries our sin from baptism to the cross. Sin. Sin is not an action. It is only the condition of the heart. Some truth, some error. Where are, the, where are the lines sometimes? It's not an action. It's only the condition of the heart. Therefore, the heart cannot be trusted. It only produces bad things. And I've got to say, this is definitely some twisting, because there's some things that uh, nuances here that I can say, yeah. But there's other things like, no. The heart can only produce bad things. So we need to repent, right? We need to repent. But what do we need to repent of? Well, sin, the way Oxu Park defines it is. Salvation is gained by repenting of the heart's condition. Because that's what sin is. It's just the condition of the heart. And the heart produces bad things. And that's only what sin is, is what he said. And this is an example of repenting. According to Oxu Park, you would re- true repentance would be saying, I am a seed of sin. There is no fruit I can produce other than sin. The core of my heart is dirty. That is true repentance. Do we have a problem with what he's saying? It sounds close, doesn't it? Or maybe, maybe it's clear. Continuing, we should not be confessing, I stole. I murdered, I lied. We need to confess that we are humans by nature who could only sin. Now this starts to get a little clear, I think. You shouldn't confess that you've done bad things. You only confess to God the condition of your heart. See, now it's crossed the line. When you start tweaking something in the front, as it rolls downhill, it changes. Or One illustration I've I've liked over the years, when you put your shirt on in the morning, if you get that first button wrong, everything else down falls apart. And you look in the mirror and you look pretty strange. And what the cults do, and definitely Oxu Park, is when you kind of tweak something here at the beginning, everything kind of falls down and it starts getting further and further from the truth. So you shouldn't confess to God that you've done bad things, because that's not sin. Sin is only the condition of the heart. So once you confess your sins, oh, sorry, confess your sin, not sins plural, because sins plural, that's action. If you confess your sin, the condition of your heart, now we have the doctrine of what we call sanctification as Christians. Sanctification is our growth towards God in life. Hopefully purifying ourselves as we get closer to God, we understand him better and we become better people, we become better Christians. According to Oxford Park, after repentance... He says, Jesus will come to you and he will cast out the filthy and dirty parts of the heart. So that's God's part. Our role is to repent of our sin 
Lord, I am only a seed of sin. And then Jesus will come and he will cast out the filthy and the dirty parts of you. And he will clean your heart. And your heart will be clean. Your heart will be pure. You see those buttons as they get lower and lower? It's starting to get stranger, isn't it? But if you meet somebody of the Good News Mission, and they were to talk to you about repentance and sin, and they were talked about some of these other aspects of it, it might sound okay or maybe a little off, but it's when you start working through this, it gets further and further down the road problematic. Evil, filthy, lustful, and deceitful thoughts are removed by Jesus. If when you repent. So sanctification, as far as growing, you think really wouldn't be a part in his scheme because Jesus comes in and does all this. Is there any growth? And what Park says, a peaceful and warm heart of faith and joy will arise. If you've repented, this will be the result. Now, bad actions may continue. I, Oxford Park's not crazy. You can see that people, once they do this thing he calls repentance, they may still be doing bad things like lying, stealing, etc. That still happens in people's lives. But don't repent. You're not supposed to repent. Because repentance is only when you're addressing that sin condition of your heart. You don't even really acknowledge ever that you're doing something wrong, that you've done something wrong. Now, he's not saying it's okay to go out and lie and steal. He's just saying that it's not even really a thing. You're not actually doing it. That's just the condition of your heart, and you need to be trusting in what the Bible says instead. And we'll get there. Yeah, instead, cling to God's word that pronounces you sinless. Because, right, the Bible does that. Once you receive Jesus, you're sinless? No. No, there's some passages that you can twist to make it sound like that you've stopped sin, but... No, no, not according to the Bible. We looked at verses yesterday in Ecclesiastes that there's not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. It's Ecclesiastes 7, I think 18. Oxu Park on the subject says, we should not try to do good or try to stop sinning. I just look at that line so far. We should not try to do good or try to stop sinning. Remember, this is the 21st century new Christian telling us, as a pastor, have you ever recommended this to your congregation? Don't, don't try to do good, but he's very serious. If the heart of Jesus dwells in us, that heart will lead us to do good, allow us to live an obedient life to the Lord, and give us great glory and increase our joy. Because Jesus comes in and totally cleanses your heart, and there is no more sin. Even if there's sin actions, your heart is sinless. I don't know how you would have sin actions if your heart was perfect and pure. It makes me wonder, would he think, and I don't, I, he, I don't think he would say this, but Jesus' heart was perfect and pure. Could he have had sin actions? So it's really muddied down. When we look at um, 2 Corinthians 11, yesterday, the purity and simplicity of devotion to Christ, verse 4. This changes everything with Oxu Park. So let's look at... Some responses to some of this. The atonement. What did he start with? The priest. Leviticus 4.33, the priest laid only one hand on the lamb instead of both hands. It's interesting. Oxo Park wants to emphasize it's two hands. I don't think that's a huge deal. I don't know why he would say it then if it was two hands or one hand. But, I mean, let's not quibble over something small. But this didn't transfer sin. Yeah, the, the priest laid his hand on the lamb, but there was no transfer of sin to the lamb. One of those things, again, Oxu Park takes some ideas from the Bible that are there and then adds some other ideas. And this is one where it's easy to get past. Okay, he lays his hand on the lamb, and we know that there's the, the scapegoat that carries the sins off into the wilderness. It was part of the, the temple ceremony, so it might get past us. But wait a minute. No, this didn't transfer sin to the Lamb. That's not how it worked. The Old Testament doesn't say this. But a bigger problem is, if you think about what Oxford Park said sin is, if sin is only the condition of the heart, then what transferred to the Lamb? See, there's a problem with the sin transferring to him. 
And yes, the lamb is a picture of what happens with Jesus when he goes to the cross. But it's not like that there was something that actually transferred and therefore we needed hands laid on for the sins to, to change. Oxu part makes it sound like that's what's happening, but it doesn't even make any sense in his own system. Scripture doesn't say that John the Baptist laid hands on Jesus. So it's another point where his system doesn't work. And that shouldn't miss our attention, because they want to make this a point. It transfers to from John the Baptist to Jesus. Well, how did it get to John the Baptist in the first place? All of our sins, and then Jesus carried it around. But Jesus didn't carry sin beginning at his baptism. Whether it's Oxu Parts, definition of sin, or how the Bible characterizes sin. Jesus doesn't carry sin from the beginning at his baptism. Now, we have 1 Peter 2.24 that... Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree, or some versions will say in his body on the cross. So yes, Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross, but it doesn't mean that he was actually took on some kind of physical or spiritual something or energy or condition of our hearts. He bore the penalty for our sin. Not that anything was transferred to him by John the Baptist. That doesn't work in the Bible. So what is sin, according to the Bible? Well, sinful actions do come from the heart. This is where there's a nuance here that I think Oxupart has a handle on. Sinful actions do come from the heart. The, uh, Matthew 12 says the, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So sin is in our heart and it produces sin action. Yes, he's right, but he takes this so far, I think it distorts and twists the gospel. And he would think that only his organization is the one that's accurately representing the gospel and preaching the gospel. But actions are also sinful. The Bible represents actions as sinful, probably more than just saying that the heart is where the sin is. Sexual immorality, causing your brother to stumble, showing partiality. All these things are in the Bible, all of the New Testament here, saying these actions are sin. So actions are sin. The condition of our heart is sin also. And if that's the truth, we need repentance of actions as well as just, well, the condition of my heart is damaged or sick or however Oxy Park wants to put it. And if we get our minds around what sin is in the Bible, it will help us get our minds wrapped around what repentance is then. It's not just repentance of the heart, whereas I think that is an important part of it. Repentance is not just repenting of actions, but it includes that. People should repent of sinful actions, definitely. Acts 3.19 Peter in his sermon, uh, when people want to know, well, what, what can we do after he, they hear Peter preach? He says, repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. So when you're talking about sins, plural, it's talking about behavior and action. Where if we say, you know, repent of sin, that might be about actions, but more likely it's about our heart and who we are and what we are. There's nothing we can do on the outside that makes us worthy to God because of the sin that's inside of us, our nature. I believe we should be repenting of both. Definitely ongoing in our Christian life. Believers should repent after salvation. Now, that doesn't mean we're repenting to get salvation. I think once a Christian repents, I totally believe that the Bible says that once God forgives you, you are forgiven. Always, But that doesn't mean we still don't repent and confess our sins to God. In Revelation chapter 2, where John, the Apostle John is having visions seen of the different churches in the beginning of Revelation. And Jesus comes to the different churches. And in chapter 2, verse 5, he tells the one church, repent and do the works you did at first. So repent meaning that you stop doing the works you're doing now and start doing the works that you did at the first. So, Christians, we do repent of sin because we stray. Those things are serious in our lives when we start to stray. And God uses those to teach us and correct us and bring us back. But we still repent. 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as Christians, we confess our sins to God. And I see this very much along the lines of repentance. We confess our sins. We go to God. We acknowledge what we've done, not just the condition of our heart. We acknowledge our actions before God. And he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. This isn't just saying a one-time thing. This is an ongoing process in our lives as we're working on our sanctification, growing closer to God. Christians will never be without sin. Oxo Park characterized it as that we would be sinless. Jesus comes in and cleanses our heart, and we are sinless. 1 John 1.10 If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You will never get to that point where you are sinless. Oxo Park thinks that you're going to get there as soon as you confess and do your real repentance, you're going to be there. But no, if you ever get to that point, you could say that you're not a sinner. And no, John says, you would make him a liar. I don't know about you, but that's pretty strong words. You don't want to make God a liar. God says you're not going to get to that point. In Romans 6.13, Paul urges us, do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members from God as instruments for righteousness. So we have the ability to sin in our actions. We can present our members as instruments for unrighteousness. Paul says, no, don't do that. We have, as Christians, can stray and go off on the paths. And it bewilders me what goes on in the lives and minds of followers of the Good News Mission. To, to see these things in their lives and not be able to just confess and go to God and acknowledge. It's like you have to live not being able to admit the truth. And I've talked to former members of the Good News Mission who said that the, one of the difficulties is dealing with kids once they become teenagers. I'm guessing Zambian teenagers do the same thing in America. They rebel, don't they? But if you're in the Good News Mission and your kids are in the Good News Mission, you can't really tell them that what they're doing is wrong. Because if they have repented, then what they're doing is not something that they need to repent for. We can see the problem of where this goes, goes way off the scales. It's kind of a, a brief run through of their doctrine. And I told you I'm going to come back to this International Mind Education Institute. You might have met Good News Mission members. By the way, does anybody, has anybody ever talked to somebody with the Good News Mission? Okay, some, some of you. Uh, so you, you might have met people who go to the Good News Mission, or you might have encountered International Mind Education Institute. This sounds like a good organization, especially the way that they promote themselves. But it's nothing more than Oxu Park and his teachings. But the way this man markets himself is like, Wow, this guy gets himself into some of the, the biggest name places around this planet. It's sometimes this mind education institute is like this series of seminars. They're they're offered sometimes through the International Youth Fellowship that I mentioned and the Christian Leaders Fellowship, which is another front group organization of Oxu Park. They come into your area and it. Christian Leaders Fellowship, and hey, they're, they're inviting us pastors to come out. Sounds like a good thing, right? Why not? I'll always be checking to see now who started this group, or who started this organization that's inviting me to come. So this is what this program claims. It will come to universities and governments and not present itself as a religious organization. It will come and, and say things like, um, we, we teach people how to possess a mindset to become successful and have a happy life. That sounds like a good thing. It contributes to helping the future of a nation, the youth, so that they may find their true values and goals. These lectures are given in schools, military bases, government offices, companies, prisons, etc. And I'm quoting directly, this is, this is from the literature that they give to heads of government and heads of school all over the planet. 
as of May of 2019, they have they've had over 20,000 lectures in these past three years to over 8.5 million people in over 95 countries. Again, Oxu Park markets himself in amazing ways. I have no idea how he's done this. And they, they give these exaggerated claims. They say, if you let us come here and teach in your country, in your school, or whatever, these are the claims. Oxu Park, they say, he is a mind education expert and the best mind educator of the age. Now, if you're a student here at CABU, I'm, I'm sure that you, you had to take a, a mind education class, and they probably talked about, well, the, you know, there's this guy who's he's the best one, right? What even is this? A mind education expert. But this is what is, is said about Oxford Park. It says, the, the Mind Education Institute solves severe mental and social problems, divorce, suicide rates, game addictions, and bullying. Basically, solves all your problems. Let us come to your country. In Kenya, it, so some of the literature by the Mind Education Institute, it will give quotations from leaders of countries like in Kenya. Uh, the, the president said, this mind education is not only for youth, police, and inmates, but for all people. This education that can change mind is really important and necessary. So, Aksu Park has brought his mind education to Kenya. And Malawi, where the president said this, Government will support the mind education as it embarks on training the youth in moral values and globalized mindset change. Or in Zambia, mind education is essential for young people in Zambia. With this education, I think the future of Zambia's youth is very bright. He markets this mind education, these seminars, to governments, to universities, and it's done, it's packaged in a way that people don't realize this is religious. It's, it's indoctrination about Aksu Park's theology. Aksu Park has no formal training in education. So for them to say he's a mind education expert, he has no education. How is he a mind education expert? Not that even anybody even knows what that is. Mind education has no formal authentication by any credible Christian denomination, governmental agency, or academic institution. So all of this expertise that they are claiming, oh, we, we're going to come in and we're going to solve all your social problems. Suicide rates, battered wives, whatever it is, they're going to fix it. Mind lectures are religious. They're not scientific as they would claim. The lectures are based on Oxford Park's personal view of sin, salvation, and what he calls the world of the heart. And that's basically what we just talked about, his view of sin and Jesus cleaning up the heart and all that. His mind lectures teach your heart is not trustworthy. Therefore, you need to free yourself of inner thoughts. You need to get rid of whatever your thoughts are trying to drive you and, and make you make decisions. You shouldn't listen to those. Well, how in the world are you going to make any decisions if you don't listen to your heart, right? You need to trust the thoughts of your leaders. Who wants to trust your leaders that much? And what leaders ultimately would they want you to, to trust? The shepherd, the pastor, Oxford Park. That's who that they want you to trust instead of trusting your heart. If you encounter somebody in the Good News Mission or Shinshonji or the Mormons or whoever, please know you, oh gosh, now I've got to, I've got to memorize everything about this group. You're never going to know everything. You never will. I was thinking of this just before we started today, James 1.19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Quick to hear. Slow to speak and slow to anger. You don't need to have all the answers. You don't need to have all the answers right there. One of the most powerful things that I have found in doing evangelism with with people in these different groups, when they're pressing in on some kind of doctrine, one of the best things you can do sometimes is say, I don't know. It's to be honest with them and say, wow, yeah, I, I don't know. I've never heard that before. I'd like to think about that. And can we talk later? 
Because when you start to scramble inside your head and start thinking, well, maybe this is the right answer. I'm just going to say it this way. They know when you're scrambling. It's not going to make you look bad to admit that you're not sure. In fact, it's going to, you'll be endured to their heart. Like, that's, that's a good thing. Ask questions. Be quick to listen. Think about them. Think about why are they in this group? What about this group is attractive to them? I was talking to a Jehovah's Witness just a few days ago, and he brought up a verse in Ecclesiastes. I asked him, well, you know, what, what is a Bible verse that's important to you? He brought up a verse in Ecclesiastes that says, basically, it sounds like when you die, you're gone. You do not have a spirit that survives after death. And I, I thought at first he was trying to make a Jehovah's Witness argument that we don't have a spirit. And instead, I'm so glad, I think it's God led me to ask him, so why is that important to you? He says, because in my, like the African tribal religion he was brought up in, spirits come back and haunt you. And he was always scared of that. And then when the Jehovah's Witnesses showed him that verse, it gave him comfort. That was the last thing I wanted to jump on. I'm not going to try to tear that down. There's other things I want to address with him. Kennedy is going to come up and say a few things about Good News Mission, perhaps where you might be encountering them. Yeah, um, I just want to talk a few stuff about the, the Good News Mission. I know for some of us it's our first time to hear about the Good News Mission, but Martin here, Martin is a student at CBU. He can testify that the Good News Mission are at CBU. I am a lecturer here at Central African Baptist University, and once in a while I go teach blog classes in different parts of the country. Last December I was in Livingston, and um, there the, uh, the group I was teaching, the pastors, they told me, actually we meet every Wednesday, and we have Pastor Kim of the Good News Mission who leads the Bible studies. That's just how cunning they are. A couple of years ago, uh, the mind education program was compulsory at CBU to first years. So you couldn't go through CBU without going through the mind education lectures under Oxo Park at CBU. The same story at the University of Malawi, the Chancellor College, the university that trains lawyers and liberal arts. You couldn't proceed to second year if you don't pass the mind education program in first year. But here we're talking about CBU right here. I've been doing my own personal research about um, their progress at uh, CBU, and Martin here and a few other folks have been uh, providing data to me. Now they have a counseling center on campus. They no longer teach, it's no longer compulsory to first years here, but then they've been offered space at the university where they operate as a counseling center. If you go for counseling, of course they will tell you it's psychiatric counseling, but at the end of the day, you're going to get theology, and the theology based on Oxo Park. We can talk about a lot many groups, as tomorrow will come, we'll continue with these groups, but I personally, in my own opinion, I find the Good News Mission as a very cunning and very strategic group. They target the elite, the intelligent people, because they know you and me, we are the leaders of this country tomorrow. No wonder they target universities, colleges. They are at Tiwunza. I have my niece at Tiwunza. She says, oh, yeah, 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 they are here. Uh, there's a Korean pastor who he, he, he is very nice. He's very nice. As Tim said, this program is advertised in such a way that it's very attractive, sometimes it becomes very irresistible, especially for our Zambian brothers and sisters, especially here we don't ask a lot of questions. It's time to open our eyes. Let's hold hands together as we continue descending and reaching out. If you have a child, if you're a parent, you have a child and the child is at CBU, any other university, ask them, they could be victims of this. Ask them how they are doing. Ask them if they know anything about the Good News Mission. Most of them will tell you they know. They do.